Hello, everyone. It's Dennis from Collider Games. I'm also joined by my co-host, uh, Dorian Parks. Dorian, uh, we got we got a special one today um, from the highly anticipated Cyberpunk 2077. We have a senior quest designer, Patrick Mills. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Good, doing good. Uh, thanks for joining us and spending uh, some of your precious time with us today to answer questions about... Uh, this game that you know myself and I'm sure a lot of ton, a ton of other people are highly anticipated. It's probably one of the highly most anticipated games of the year, possibly in the last several years. Um, and I'm sure you're busy, uh, you know, with a lot of interviews and whatnot. <laughs> and and you know, uh, still working on stuff. So uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, the game comes out on uh, November nineteenth. Mm -hmm. um and we're 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 super pumped for it. um the first thing i want to kind of ask you just in general like a senior quest designer for the people in the audience that don't know what that job entails can you kind of mm -hmm. describe describe what you do so uh the job of a quest designer is um uh to come up with the Exp the experience, particularly the narrative experience that the player encounters. So that means you come up with the scenario, the stories, like what are the characters going to do? What is the player going to do as they move through the story? And then it's a matter of implementing that with all of these other teams. So you have like environment art uh, producing things for you and decorating things and making them look nice. You have level designers making sure that all the sight lines are clear and that the combat is fun. Uh, you have, uh, of course, you have your programmers giving you new systems and things like that. Uh, and, you know, uh, you've got your writers that actually write the dialogue and we put it all together. The quest designer is the one who puts all of those pieces together to make sure that when you're playing the quest, you're having the best experience possible. How do you keep all of that organized? Because that's a lot, a lot of stuff. That is why we have producers. And, uh, and it is partially a quest designer's responsibility as well is also to make sure that the part that you're working on is as high a quality as you can make it. Um, and working with all those teams and managing your time and um, uh, managing you know, when you need to get new things from other teams. Uh, making sure that those can be done. And then you have producers on top of that, making sure that everything runs smoothly. So, Matt, Can you just talk about how you fell into just quest designing and, and how the, your passion started for that in general? Well, you know, I've, I've been working on, you know, I've been making games since I was a kid. And I think a lot of kids do, you know, um, I would, we traveled a lot as uh, when I was a kid and I would come up with, uh, little stories that I'd just tell my brother and then I'd ask him, okay, now what do you want to do next? I mean, they weren't, they didn't have rules. They didn't have anything. They were just little imagination games. Um, I, I mean, that was probably the start of it, but you know, more recently I worked uh, in the nineties. I actually worked on, um, I did mods for first person shooter games. And uh, from there wound up working at, um, uh, wound up working at another studio um, uh, being as a designer and, uh, and that brought me to here. And, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the path. That's the very short version. That's the very short version. And then with the, the whole idea of a adapting uh, cyberpunk 2020, the tabletop game created by mm -hmm. Mike Pondsmith, how did that, the inception of the, the, the idea to adapt it into a video game begin? Well, you know, I wasn't actually at this studio oh. when that happened, but, um, I do know that a lot of the people um, uh, who were involved in that played Cyberpunk 2020 back in the day. Um, you know, we're in Poland and uh, a lot of things didn't get localized into Polish. Um, but Cyberpunk 2020, along with a lot of the other source materials, I think this is, yeah, this is actually an English version that we've got here, but we have Polish versions floating around that are, you know, 20 years old um, uh, or Oh, no, they're not 20 years old. They're 30 years old. I feel very, oh my, I'm, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, it was localized into Polish. And uh, so a lot of people here played it. I actually have a, an anecdote. Uh, when I first moved here, um, I was setting up a bank account and I was talking to this banker who was helping me set up the account. And he asked me, where do you work? And I said, uh, CD Projekt. And he I don't know what that is. And I repeated it because I remembered I'm saying it wrong. It's CD Projekt. And, uh, and then he, he said, oh, they make, the, um, they make the Witcher games, yeah? And I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I never played them. I didn't really like those books. 
um, what are you guys working on now? And I said, uh, Cyberpunk, uh, Cyberpunk 2077. And his eyes got wide. <laughs> and he says, uh, and he says, he says, you know, I used to play that all the time when I was a kid. And he got really excited. And seeing this guy, you know, this banker who the whole time was just flat faced, you know, expressionless, suddenly get really excited. So I think the games had an impact here. And so that's part of it. And then there's another crew of people that have come in afterwards um, who are people like me who played this when they were younger or even just had people that they knew who played it or older siblings that played it and uh, and have been drawn to the cyberpunk aesthetic through films and uh, and uh, TV shows and and uh, and anime and things like that and are just you know really excited to work on something like this yeah and, and Patrick I did want to ask so with mm-hmm. this with this in particular you kind of built you you you've been working on this project for a couple of years now so what has it been like uh, with adapting source material usually the the original yeah. creators aren't usually involved so what has it been like to actually work with the creator and and kind of make sure like you're you're not you're doing it justice yeah it's been it's been really exciting because we of course have worked with Mike Pondsmith the original creator and I've been lucky enough to be one of the people who works directly with Mike Pondsmith. And it's been really fun and really rewarding to, you know, be able to work on stuff that's new and then take it to him and say, well, what do you think about this? And he says, oh, that's really cool. Um, uh, That's really cool. I really like that idea. And of course they're working on, um, they're working on the new pen and paper version right now, uh, Cyberpunk Red, which I think is coming out around the same time as us. I don't know the exact date. Um, uh, And, they'll incorporate some of our ideas into theirs. And then we'll take some of their ideas and incorporate them into ours so that we have a, a continuity. You know, um, we really wanted Cyberpunk 2077. Um, you can go into it not knowing anything about Cyberpunk 2020. You know, you can go in and you can play it and that's great. We built it to work that way. But if you do know about Cyberpunk 2020 and sort of the the lore and all the tidbits and stuff, you can see that stuff in it. And so you'll be rewarded if you bring that extra information into the game. And it's it's really fun to be able to put that stuff in. Nice. And then, you know, with The Witcher being, you know, established huge franchise, but it's, it's in mm-hmm. the third person perspective and you guys are mm-hmm. doing first person perspective. What do you think that brings into this game, especially a game of this scale? When you are in Night City and you're moving around Night City in first person, it's really, really exciting. And it's something that I've not seen before like this in a game. I've not ever really seen this before. And I think that other people are going to feel the same way when they finally see it. And it really does bring a level of immersion. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I was one of those skeptics. You know, I was one of those skeptics when we we announced that we were doing the first person internally. I was thinking, oh no, you know, I really, I really wish that we were doing third person because it's something we know how to do, and uh, and 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 I and I, and I and I could picture it in my head. I could picture it's Witcher three, and then is with guns now, and so we'll we'll do that. But we didn't do that. We didn't do the easy thing. We never do the easy thing here. And we went. We developed. We you know we worked on all of this stuff really really hard, and. I really think that people, when they play it, they'll they'll understand why it needs to be first person when they play it, and it's yeah, it's it's really exciting to just walk around the city and look around, and it feels good. It feels good. What kind of uh, movies or television shows were inspirational and influential mm-hmm. to to you guys when you were working on Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven? Mm. Well, lots of them because we do have a lot of people working here. We have a lot of developers. Um, there's actually, you know, I can tell you, for example, I can tell you, oh, well, I know that Akira was was very influential for a lot of people here. Um, but there are things that I don't even know, right? Like I saw someone on Twitter the other day point out a screenshot that we had put up of walking down into afterlife. There are these stairs down and these stairs up and, you know, through this, you know, sort of doorway. And I always remember seeing that in game and thinking, oh, that feels really familiar, but I don't know what that is. And somebody had put it there with uh, a screen capture of one of the opening moments of Akira when uh, I think it's Tetsuo goes down into the yeah. bar at the very beginning. And it's the same stairway, it's the same doorway. And I was like, I didn't even know that was there. I am, you know, I've of course watched Akira many times and I've been playing the game, but I never noticed it. Um, but we've got all sorts of things in there. Um, we've got a, 
we've got a, an homage to um, Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence, that I'm really excited for people to see and, uh, and react to and see the reactions to that. Um, but the, but, and, then, and then when it comes to like our story, our story is actually really heavily influenced by uh, noir movies and sort of like hard boiled detective fiction and things like that. Um, and there's a lot of character ideas that you'll see that'll remind you of old noir movies um, and even some newer noir movies, um, some beats in the story that'll hit you very similarly. Um, so yeah, we're all over the place in terms of our influences, but I think that we've managed to make it all gel together in a way that's cool and fresh and pretty exciting. I I'm excited to see what people think. Nice. And and just speaking of movies, we you have one of the the biggest movie stars, one of the biggest people celebrities of mm -hmm. all time. Keanu Reeves is one of the as, as Mr. Silver. So can you talk about just bringing him on and then working with him and incorporating him into the story? I know he's playing a character mm -hmm. that was originally adapted from the source material. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? Uh, it was really cool. Um, uh, I I think there's a I think. I, I think I put this in an interview with you guys, um, but there's this, um, uh, I remember this moment and this goes back to the Pondsmith thing where we're talking to, um, we're talking to Pondsmith and he's visiting the studio and he doesn't know about Keanu Reeves yet. We've kept it secret even inside the studio. We don't want it to leak or anything like that. And he's sitting with me and we're talking and I know that he's about to go to the character art team and be shown the first images of Keanu Reeves as Johnny Silverhand. And, and he says, um, he says, well, as long as you didn't make him blonde and he shouldn't have a beard. And I thought, oh no, oh no, oh no, this is awful. This is terrible. And so he goes and he leaves the room and he does his thing and we come back together later and he sits down with me. He says, well, I still think he should be blonde, but if you can get Keanu Reeves, you should get Keanu Reeves. And Keanu, like the, the character of Johnny Silverhand actually wound up being a really good fit for Keanu. Um, uh, he's able to do a lot with very little. He's able to get that, this, Johnny's an angry person. He's a really angry person. And when Keanu gets angry, he can really show it. He can really show it. He, you very often don't see it in his movies because he, he's, you know, he's well known for being kind of the, the mellow guy. You get him for the mellow roles. Um, but when he gets angry, and you can see it sometimes like in John Wick, for example, um, but in this game, you're gonna get to see Johnny angry. You're gonna get to see him pissed off, animated. And yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really great working with him. And, uh, and I think he's done a great job. Nice. Awesome. Um, with, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, with voice actors and mm -hmm. you said dialogue, like how many in a game this size, how many voice actors are, were being used and how much, Ooh. how many pages of dialogue did you guys, did you guys have to write? Well, record in terms of how many actors we have, I'm not sure. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, all of our main characters, uh, to my knowledge, almost all of our main characters are uh, unique voice actors. And then we have voice actors who provide uh, background roles as well and things like that. Um, in terms of line count, I can just reference um, our Japanese localization team recently, I guess just for fun, printed out all of the dialogue in the game. Just the dialogue, not, just all, not all of the text, but all of just the dialogue. And it was a table I don't know, about like this. I don't know if you can see perspective here. Yeah. About like okay. this, with papers stacked this high all the way across it. Um, it's, it's an incredible amount of, of dialogue in the game, uh, all of it fully voiced, and we localize it into um, 17 languages, I think. Wow. Um, and then of those, I think uh, eight, don't quote me on that, but I think eight of them are with full VO and lip sync and everything. Um, it's really... Uh, monstrously huge thing and it's really exciting to be part of something that big uh and i think it's really cool also that we're localizing into all those different languages um and trying to deliver a parody of experience across all those regions so you know if you're playing the game in brazilian portuguese we want you to be playing the same game that you're playing in american english um uh, or latin american spanish 
you know, all of uh, or Japanese, all of those. We want them to be as close to the same game as we can make them, and that includes, you know, uh, full performances. You know. And I'm curious, with a game this big, because we kind of touched on it earlier, with a game this big, as a quest designer, how do you go about just approaching how many, there's so many different options, mm -hmm, like, because mm -hmm. it's a personal story of, like, them being able to choose how they, what what group they pick and how, what mm -hmm, faction they mm -hmm. want to do. So how do you go about just handling all that while making sure, like, you're not losing track of the end goal? Well, generally, so we have two different major kinds of quest content. We have uh, main quest and then we have side quests. And then we also have uh, a few other things, but there are other categories of side quest really. Um, and when it comes to the main quest, we have the story team and some of the higher ups uh, work through and draw out the story uh, in broad outlines. Okay, this is what happens. This, is, th this character does this, this thing happens like this. And then you'll get, as a quest designer, you'll get a little paragraph that says, this is what needs to happen. The quest designer's responsibility is then to take that paragraph, turn that into, you know, usually a six to, six to 10 page document, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Um, that explains exactly what every beat is. Okay, we're going to go into this building. We're going to meet this character. This character is going to say this. We're going to find out about that and then go over here. And the other thing that we want to do when we do that is we try to make sure that every quest is based around something cool. And that's kind of vague, but it can describe a cool scene, like a set piece, like this thing's going to happen. This big event is going to be happening in the background while you do this other thing. Um, sometimes it'll be um, a twist where something you thought was true earlier isn't true anymore. And so it changes your perspective on things. Um, sometimes it can just be, especially for smaller content, it could just be a cool character um, uh, um, or, or a theme that you just didn't make it in. And you, you try to shape around that. And then we do that with the side quests, but it's more open as well. So you just, you find something that you like, a scene in a movie that makes you think of something. Uh, there's, a, there's a quest in here that I worked on that was inspired by, it doesn't have much to do with it anymore, but it was originally inspired by the title of a Blonde Redhead album. And um, uh, it, it, that sort of thing. You find that inspiration somewhere, you put it in the middle, you start attaching pieces to it. And then at the end, you sort of back up and you go, okay, what do I have now? And then you can, you know, then you, work on it over and over and over and over again until you have something that you're proud of, something that you're happy with and something that players will enjoy. Nice. Um, in terms of like story and narrative, you know, the, the idea of AI is always a complicated one. How does AI factor into the world of Cyberpunk 2077? And mm -hmm. how, do, how does the world view that technology? Well, in uh, the world of cyberpunk, in the universe of cyberpunk, um, way back in like 2024, uh, 2024, 2025, sometime in there, um, uh, the internet gets effectively destroyed um, by this uh, hacker uh, who helped invent the internet and now he brings it down. Well, they just call it the net. Uh, uh, and he brings it down. And at that time in the 2020 setting, there were already these AIs that, um, lived in the net and were enormously powerful godlike beings inside the net. But when the net goes down, they take over completely. Some parts of it are destroyed and some parts they take over. By 2077, there's this faction um, that was in the original, but now they're different, they're changed now, called Netwatch. And one of Netwatch's core responsibilities is hunting down and destroying or imprisoning rogue AIs. And they do this under the auspices of protecting the safe network. You know, we need to make sure that the network is safe for everybody to use. Um, are they up to something maybe more sinister than that? Eh, maybe. Um, uh, 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 you know, there's always money and power involved. Uh, don't trust anybody in cyberpunk who tells you they're doing it for your own good. Um, uh, and so there are, there are AIs that are registered and licensed and they can operate and there are other AIs that aren't and they're trying to hide from Netwatch and things like that. And then there's this thing called the Black Wall. Um, the Black Wall is this, um, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, um, with uh, Neuromancer, for example, they have ice, you know, these 
countermeasures that exist, these electronic countermeasures that'll kill you if you, if you, you know, try to penetrate through them in cyberspace. We have this thing called the black wall, which is like a wall of ice. And on the other side of that is the network that Netwatch doesn't control. And what's beyond there is very mysterious, um, but it's believed to be the realm of AIs, of rogue AIs that are you know, living on the other side of this thing and who knows what they're up to. And maybe you play the game and you find out maybe some, <laughs> some of what they're up to. Just gonna ask, so you, you at, so spoke about it lightly in a previous interview, like mm -hmm. it was a while back, but I wanna talk about cars for a little bit. So we, can, we have our own car, but we can steal cars as well. Can you go into any more details about the customizational sure. features of, with the car itself? At the moment, we don't really do that much with customization, but what we okay. do have is we do have a lot of cars that you can purchase. Um, okay. You can go into the game, you can purchase cars. There's a whole quest uh, revolving around uh, buying and finding cars. Um, and uh, in, in addition to that, yeah, you can steal cars. However, you can't keep those cars. Once right. you steal the car it you know, and you leave it, it's gone. But you can get a lot of cars and, uh, what you can actually do is you can always summon any car that you want. So if you are going to a race, you want to bring your racing car. If you are just driving around the city, maybe you get a little bit slower, meatier ride, um, you know, for just, you know, cruising and, uh, and uh, you know, taking in the sights. Um, so you can pick your car to, uh, and of course, motorcycles as well. You can pick those to, you know, how you want to do the next part that you're working on. Um, you know, maybe if you're going undercover, um, to some place you get the fancy ride instead of the little little the little my my you don't want to drive up like that stuff like that. <laughs> um, what was the biggest kind of challenge creating and working on this, so specifically from 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 your position uh, in a game this size of for Cyberpunk twenty seven seven? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ooh, biggest challenge. Whew. I think I think the thing that I found most rewarding is touching on something I said earlier, which is taking this franchise from the 80s and connecting it to not, not just 2077, because 2077 is a fictional place, but taking that stuff from 1988 and drawing it forward to now and connecting it with things that are happening now. And in, in by doing so, being able to go back to that original material and point at the things that it did really well in the first place. You know, you can say, look, we thought that this was very silly. We thought that this was very silly. And it is, it is silly. It's, it's, it's silly in a, in a good way, but it's, it's sometimes it's very silly. It is a franchise that knows how to be funny. Um, uh, and it knows that it's like, okay to make jokes. Um, but at the same time, there's stuff in there that's really 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 good and going back and finding those things and bringing those forward and reinterpreting them for a new generation has been really really exciting and really rewarding as well so you mentioned in uh, our written interview that uh the movie streets of fire starring willem <laughs> dafoe and diane lane was a you know influence on this game mm -hmm. you know and that that's been described as a like a rock and roll fable a noir yeah. musical are there any kind of uh, music-oriented moments like that in this game? Certainly. Um, uh, uh, there are, music is a big part of the game. Uh, of course, we have uh, Refused acting as, um, they're playing the part of uh, Samurai, this legendary rock band. You're gonna get to see some of that. We've got a really cool radio in the game where you can flip through the stations and hear it and all of that music is original all of that music is produced just for this game and it's good stuff um uh i, I remember thinking when i first heard oh we're gonna just pay for our own music instead of licensing i'm like ah whatever it's actually really good it's really good i'm not kidding um uh and all of our like i think this is so scoop for you guys, this is, we haven't talked about this yet, but all of our quest titles, at least in the English version are based on song names. And so uh, one of the things that we did is we actually went back and we didn't do that originally. We went back and did it much later. We looked at each quest and we thought, okay, what is this quest about? Are there any songs that we can use that connect to this? And we tried to make all of them songs that Johnny Silverhand would like. 
um, uh, so, because sort of the idea behind it, the high concept behind it is that Johnny is naming all of these quests for you. So let's try to reference some songs that Johnny would like. And uh, we all, you know, a bunch of us got together and, um, and pooled all of our knowledge of all these different genres. And we needed to put more like, like, west coast punk and hardcore into the game not just west coast punk and hardcore but we needed more punk and hardcore because it's johnny silverhand and so we all got really into punk and hardcore for a while and came up with all of these new names that we could apply and figure out what to do with them and i think that's really cool and so yeah as for streets of fire you know one of the things that pondsmith said was um was true about cyberpunk is that the core of cyberpunk uh, is uh, teenagers kissing in the rain in front of a burning warehouse, right? Just things are on fire around them. Everything's falling apart, but they have found this connection and this moment of passion uh, and excitement. And, and, uh, uh, and, and I, I think that we have that in the game. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what people think. Uh, um, but it's definitely an inspiration. When, when you're talking about side quests in, in general, like how do you decide the balance of side quests that are maybe have nothing to do with the main storyline and mm -hmm. then the ones that kind of connect with what your main character's drive or mm -hmm. purpose mm -hmm. is? All of our side quests need to connect to the character oh. and who they are and their role in the world. Um, and quests that don't meet that criteria usually don't make it out of the first round. Um, uh, if there's a quest, um, and you know, we did this on Witcher 3 as well, so I can use an example from, from there, but you, know, you, you have a quest and you say, well, okay, Geralt is going to investigate, uh, is going to investigate a murder. And then someone says, why would, why would he investigate this murder? And, and then you go, Oh yeah, actually, I, I have no idea why he did investigate this murder. Quest is out, you know. Um, we did a similar process through this one, so we we come up with huge, tons and tons of pitches of just like, V does this, um, uh, V encounters a character who does this uh, or or wants this, and then we find out that it's different, things like that. Um, and what you can do though sometimes is if you can't find that connection that like, why is this character doing this? What you can do is you can go in and you can either, um, you, you have to come up with a, a reason for the character to do that. Um, but you can also find themes that aren't present in the main story that you want to bring out, that you still want to bring to the table, but they're just not in the main story. Um, and you can bring those themes and you can put those into the quests, uh, the side quests especially, and build things around those. or. Um, something that often hap that sometimes happens with uh, side quests as well is that there will be a character that's part of the main storyline, and after changes to the main storyline, that character isn't in the main storyline anymore. So you take some of the ideas that you had for them, you craft a new quest for them because by this time we're in love with the character, right? You know, we know the character, we want to put this character in the game, and so you'll find something for that character to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, Sid Mead's work, especially uh, Blade mm -hmm. Runner, influenced the aesthetic of the game, but he also has a, a lot of other things, design work that he's done before. What other work that he did kind of uh, also influenced the game? Well, certainly I think um, there's, oh, I, I don't know the name of them, but he did a, uh, He's he's done a series of um, like futuristic houses. I don't know what else to call them. I don't know the the title of them, um, uh, but some of them are like you know it's like very very um, very fine construction and things like that. Um, you know, silver and glass and things like that. elaborate, strange shapes. Uh, um, and you'll see some of that. You'll see some of that in, for example. Um, uh, you know, in Westbrook, uh, up in North Oak, which is like our, our posh neighborhood. You'll see buildings there that are very reminiscent of uh, things that Sid Mead did. Um, but, you know, there's, he's, he's all over the place. He's su he has such a wealth of, he has such a wealth of art that he produced. Um, and I know that he was a huge influence for a lot of the environment artists, even not just in this game, but just in life, the 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 reason that they do environment art at all um, is because of Sid Mead. He got them interested in art. 
Um, so that influence runs very, very deep. And yeah, when you're playing it, I think you'll see it. So another heavy hitting question. So can you talk about the, the dogs and the cats in the game? What, what, <laughs> besides petting them, what, is there anything else we can, can do with the, with the, with the pets? Uh, other than confirming that yes, you can pet the cat. I don't want to reveal any more than that. Um, I don't want to reveal any more than that. In the world of cyberpunk, there actually aren't a lot of uh, a lot of uh, animals uh, in Night City. There, we actually talk about it in the game. There's ordinances against um, against stray animals, but also even pet ownership is actually very expensive. It's something that is a um, a luxury only a affordable by a few because you have to pay huge fees to even just be able to have one of uh, an animal for yourself. Um, uh, but yes, th th there are cats and yes, you can pet it. Other That's than that, I my lips are sealed. Yeah. Uh, when it came to designing the weapons that you use in the game, were the weapons created first and then adapted narratively into storylines or were there specific weapons that were created to fit into some of the quests or storylines? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, uh, so there's a couple of layers to that. And so I was actually watching some old, old, old footage that no one outside the studio will ever see, um, but extremely ancient footage. And I was recognizing some guns in it. And this was before we really had um, a grasp on a lot of the things that we would later do. So there are some guns where the visuals came first and then we later figured out, okay, well, this is how it works and, 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 and so forth. Um, but then on the other hand, we have, um, when we came up with our timeline, the character art team or the art team in general was, uh, was part of that process of coming up with the uh, the art timeline that would run along with sort of the lore timeline. And you have these different eras and each of those eras is associated with a different art style and also with different technologies. Um, so in our game, we have tech weapons and power weapons uh, and smart weapons. Um, and those each have slightly different functions depending on what cyberware you have and how you use them, which is very cool. Um, but they also have different visual designs uh, that don't just go with the technology, but also with the manufacturer of them as well. And all of those tie into the lore. And so, for example, you'll have something like um, uh, Tsunami Arms, which uh, is, a, is a group from the original 2020. We've given, them, uh, we've given them a little bit more detailed backstory in ours, and they produce uh, certain kinds of guns. And if you actually took their guns, you can actually line up the guns that are in the game on a timeline and say like, oh, this is when they started getting into this kind of technology and all their later models incorporate that technology because that becomes their thing and you can see the evolution of the design as well. And then as another layer to that, as a, you know, as a quest designer, we actually can request uh, special guns to be given as rewards. Um, uh, yeah, and very often those are associated with a character or a faction um, or a moment in the story. We've got one very special gun. I'm very excited for people uh, to see eventually, but I'm not saying anything more. Um, and those things, we request them. We give some idea of what we think they should look like and maybe how they should operate. And then we get back from the uh, from the uh, gameplay and uh, and art teams. We get these really cool. Uh, really cool looking guns that uh, are fun to use so. and hopefully associated with, you know, whatever story beats we have lined up for them. I want to ask, uh, of course, it was just like because of this the whole pandemic and things like that. I know mm -hmm. there's like, has there been any like positives to come out of like, you know, this more the like how all the time that we've had now, is there, has there anything like positive coming out of this pandemic for you guys? Well, I get to spend a lot more time with uh, my girlfriend and my cat, um, uh, uh, which is which is nice. Um, I think that it is. It's hard to tell from my limited perspective because I don't have a uh, I don't have a super high level vision of the rest of the studio. Um, and actually, that's one of the downsides of the pandemic is I can't just go walk into the other people's office and ask what's going on. You know, hey, how are things going? But I think for me personally. Um, working from home has helped helped me figure out, uh, and and I think has helped us collectively uh, figure out what like what's important in a pipeline. 
and how to run a pipeline. I know personally have, the way that I would operate in the office um, for getting things done, uh, especially when I need to work with other teams is I get up, I walk over and I talk to the person and I find out when's it gonna come? What do they need from me? Here's what I need from you, et cetera. And doing that all electronically has been, it's different. I've had to learn new skills and I think everyone has had to learn some new skills through this process and you know, when hopefully things start reopening uh, and we can all come back to the office, uh, those are skills that we'll be able to use to become even more efficient and better at our jobs. So that's my hope. That's my hope. Uh, uh, and you know, hope is hope is important in 2020. So absolutely, absolutely yeah. is. Hey, I'm sure you've been pretty busy. You haven't been able to do uh, much extracurricular activities, but. You know, for us at, at home that are stuck at home or working at home, uh, video games is like a mm. big outlet now, especially, you know, you can't go anywhere uh, and, and how big of importance it is. And I'm wondering, like, you know, when this game comes out, I think lots of people will be very appreciative to have this as something they can kind of go into yeah. to take their mind off of you know as fantastical and uh, as it is to take their mind off of the real the real world for yeah. for a few hours a day yeah and i am really hoping it does that for people it's 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 a little bit like if we can be honest it's a little bit ironic you know that that um we're escaping from our real life cyberpunk dystopia by playing this other fantastic cyberpunk dystopia where it's pretty similar except uh except you're a you know, you're a mercenary on the mean streets, which I suppose is some sort of escape. Um, uh, uh, so, so yeah, but I, I mean, I know exactly where you're coming from because you know you can't go anywhere. Um, you can't go anywhere. You, you can't can't go to the movies. You can't go to the movies. You can't go out to dinner. You can't do the things that you normally do. You can't go hang out with your friends. So I think video games have created that space for people. Um, and that space has always been there, but more and more people are spending more and more time in that space. And it's certainly good for the industry. It's certainly good for the craft um, because there's going to be a whole new generation of people that have, you know, that are getting into this now and then they become developers later and then they make the next generation of even better, better stuff. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, it's cool. It's cool. And I, I, I really, I really am excited uh, for people to play it. So my last question would be, this is just for the future down the road, because you talked about and what I've seen thus far and all the gameplay and everything, it does feel mm -hmm. like an immersive experience. It does feel like this futuristic thing. I would love in the future, hopefully maybe one day we can get a cyberpunk VR game. Like, I don't know if y'all are working cool. on that, but, but yeah, just, I'm just that throwing that cool. out there. Like if y'all could work on that in the future, because I, I think, <laughs> I think we, we need someone to escape to, we can put it on like a little oasis or something like that. I, I, I love a cyber. Hey, game. I would love to work on that too. I would love to work on that too. That would be really cool. And then my last question, it just it just kind of feels like, a, just from an educational side of things, it feels like a, a, a quest designer essentially is like a, the TV equivalent of like almost a showrunner in a way of mm -hmm. like having mm -hmm. to put everything together. Was Is that how would you would describe it in a way? I think that that is accurate. I've never been a showrunner. I don't know any showrunners, but from the job description I hear yeah. about a showrunner, it's very similar. Like I don't, I'm not the writer. Uh, sometimes I write, sometimes I don't. Um, uh, sometimes I just give notes and I say, ah, he says this, he says this. Sometimes I do the whole thing. Um, uh, I don't dress, I don't decorate the sets myself though. Sometimes I'll, you know, take care of this thing over here. Cause I want something very specific. Um, it's, it's about putting together other people's stuff and making sure that it all gels well and that you're hitting the right themes. You're hitting the right notes. You're hitting, uh, the right character beats. Uh, to get through. And um, I think the only difference is, is that generally I think showrunners take over, you know, at least a full season of TV, whereas I am in control of a handful of quests and I have to work with the other quest designers to make sure that all of our quests are in sync. And we also have a quest director who's, who's also responsible for that by playing all the quests constantly and saying, okay, well, this needs to, this needs to you need to work on this, you need to work on this. Uh, this is really good, I'm gonna put this over here. Yeah, so, yeah, cool. yeah. All right, well, thanks so much for your time, Patrick. Yeah, no uh, is there anything else that you want the audience to know about Cyberpunk 2077 before it comes out? Oh, well, uh, 
<laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I just, I'm excited to see what people think. Like, that's where I'm at. Like, I really want to see what people think because I look at all the, I look at all the expectations that people have, and people have expectations that are over there and over here, and nobody can agree on what the game like really is. You know, we we've put the marketing out there, we've tried to give an idea of what you'll be doing in the game and what the story is about, and and some of the things. Um, but the game is much more than that. You know, the game is much more than that, and there's more coming in, and seeing what people are saying, I'm just really excited to see what they react when the real thing is there and they're playing it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting for sure. And I think people are going to be really happy with it. So. Yeah, I, I believe so. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Cyberpunk 2077 comes out on November 19th uh, everywhere. Uh, Patrick, thanks so much. And uh, we'll be uh, looking forward to playing the game uh, yeah. as much as the rest of the world. <laughs> I'm looking thank forward you, to hearing what you guys think. So. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful talking to you guys. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank no you. problem. <laughs>